Virgin Galactic's VSS Unity flies for the last time, ESA finds water ice on an unexpected region of Mars, New Glenn are now eligible to fly military missions, and we get some rather scary insight into astronaut emergency simulations. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 14th of June, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week, we saw the final flight of Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 VSS Unity. On June 8th, carrier aircraft VMS Eve rolled down the runway at Spaceport America with the space plane under its wing. A little under an hour later, VSS Unity was released and ignited its hybrid rocket motor at 1526 UTC. Commander Nicola Pachile and pilot Jamil Janjua flew the space plane up to an altitude of 87.5 kilometers. In addition to the flight crew, VSS Unity carried four passengers. The first passenger was Turkish Space Agency astronaut Tuva Adesever, who was the backup mission specialist for Axiom Space's AX-3 mission earlier this year. On this flight, contracted through Axiom, Adesever participated in experiments for the Turkish Space Agency. The other passengers on this flight were SpaceX Principal Propulsion Engineer Andy Sadvani, real estate developer and pilot Irving Pergament, and Hotel and Resort Investment Strategy Advisor Giorgio Menenti. With the exception of Commander Pachile, who was flying for a fourth time, everyone on board VSS Unity was flying to space for their first time. In addition to the passengers, the space plane carried two science payloads. The first one was an experiment from Purdue University that studied propellant slosh, which is a problem spacecraft propulsion systems have to deal with in microgravity. The other experiment was provided by University of California, Berkeley, and was designed to test new 3D print technology in microgravity. After a 15-minute flight, VSS Unity landed safely back on the runway at Spaceport America, bringing to a close its 12th and final spaceflight. Virgin Galactic has now paused their commercial flight program to focus on development of their upcoming Delta class of space planes, which will take place over the next two years. Virgin hopes that the first commercial flight of this Delta class will happen in 2026, so we'll have to wait a while until the next flight. It's not guaranteed that this will happen, though, as the company is tight on money and will have to push through development with what it has. If it happens, this flight may have been the last for Virgin Galactic, but we certainly hope that's not the case. For the first time, scientists have spotted frost at Mars' equator. The frozen water was spotted on volcanoes in the planet's Tharsis region. This place is home to many volcanoes, including Olympus Mons, which is the tallest mountain in the solar system. While water ice has previously been detected at Mars' poles, finding it at the planet's equator has proven to be much harder. What makes it so hard? Well, the planet's thin atmosphere and the heat from the sun make the mountaintops relatively warm, or at least too warm for the peaks to be frosty. But scientists found that on some early winter mornings, there's a thin layer of frost deposited on the volcano summits. So to find this ice, scientists had to observe the volcanoes at just the right time. But not every satellite sent to the red planet can observe the equator in the early morning. This is where ESA's two Mars orbiters come in for help. The scientists had used the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter while looking for frost near the equator during a different study, but they were surprised to find it on the planet's volcanoes. They then confirmed their findings using ESA's Mars Express satellite. Researchers suspect that the frost is the result of unique microclimates in the large hollow areas called calderas at the top of the volcanoes. They also believe the source of the water is actually the planet's own atmosphere. The mechanism by which this happens is very similar to how we see rain and snow in some mountain regions here on Earth. Winds bring moist air from the surface up to the top of the volcanoes, where the moisture condenses and forms frost in their calderas. A similar effect has been observed in other regions on Mars as well. Though the layer of frost is very thin, likely not much thicker than a human hair, there's actually a lot of water involved as it covers a large area. Findings like these can be really important for future missions to the Red Planet, especially for in-situ resource utilization. Discoveries like this open up the possibility for future Martians to use water from unusual places where we didn't expect to find it just a few years ago. So this is why we're always really excited to see studies just like this one. Imagine it's almost midnight, you have the ISS comms live stream opened up on a tab, and suddenly you start hearing that a commander is having a medical emergency. Unfortunately, um, the prognosis for commander is relatively uh, uh, tenuous, I'll say at this point, uh, to keep it generic. 
He needs to be strapped into a seat with an oxygen mask and needs monitoring of his pulse. Wait, that sounds really scary, right? Well, something like this actually happened this week, and it spooked a lot of us. On Wednesday, teams at SpaceX simulated an emergency in which a crew member was suffering from the effects of decompression sickness. Now, simulations like these are regularly performed to help train teams for real emergencies during missions, but this time, some of the communications of the simulation were accidentally broadcast on NASA's ISS livestream, obviously leaving a lot of us very concerned. But as mentioned, and thankfully, this was later confirmed to have just been a simulation, and there was no actual emergency. In fact, the astronauts on the station were safely enjoying their sleep period at that time. But the broadcast audio did provide some insight into the types of situations that astronauts and ground crews are trained to deal with. For this simulation, a flight surgeon was stuck in traffic in Los Angeles and had to phone in to assist with the emergency. The flight surgeon advised to get the injured astronaut into his spacesuit and strap him into his seat, using the suit as a makeshift hyperbaric chamber. Then, contact details were shared for a Spanish hospital with access to appropriate care facilities for decompression sickness, which would allow the astronaut to be properly treated. This suggests that an emergency deorbit and crew rescue might be considered in this particular scenario, and that teams are trained and ready to perform rescue and recovery operations at all times during a mission. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to see any astronauts being rescued, as this was just an exercise, but we're certainly glad to know that the astronauts and the ground teams are well prepared to deal with all kinds of emergencies, even if they are kind of spooky. This week, Stoke Space announced that it's fired up its new full-flow staged combustion Methalox engine for the first time. The engine is powered by methane and liquid oxygen, so the pictures show beautiful blue flames, followed by the usual orange color from the residual methane in the exhaust, burning with the oxygen in the atmosphere. The test involved a very short firing of the engine, just enough to reach its target starting power level and then shut down. Once fired at full power, it should produce 100,000 pounds of thrust, which is about 45 tons, or about 440 kilonewtons. The engine runs on a full-flow staged combustion cycle, just like Raptor, so this now becomes the second Methalox engine to use this cycle, and the fourth full-flow staged combustion cycle engine ever developed. Seven of these engines are set to power the first stage for the company's upcoming Nova rocket, a two-stage medium-lift launched vehicle designed to be fully reusable from the beginning. Earlier in the year, Stoke revealed that it had already started work on a vertical test stand for the first stage, which should come online this summer. Now, in case you don't remember, last year the company already demonstrated vertical takeoff and vertical landing of a prototype of Nova's hydrogen-powered second stage, like a starhopper of sorts. We've also seen development tanks already built for the rocket's first stage, and a firing of the full engine that will be used on the rocket's second stage. With both stages now well into development, there will surely be many more exciting tests to come. The U.S. Space Force announced this week that it selected SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, and Blue Origin for Lane 1 of the third phase of the National Security Space Launch Program. The National Security Space Launch Program, also known just as NSSL Program, is the successor to the U.S. Air Force's Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program that was set up in the 1990s and ran until the 2010s. The first phase of the NSSL Program, which began in 2018, gave funding to different launch companies to further develop their rockets and systems so they could meet the military's challenging demands. These new rockets and systems didn't necessarily have to be expendable, which is why the agency dropped the name Expendable from the program and renamed it to what it is now. The companies that won Phase 1 were ULA, Northrop Grumman, and Blue Origin, who all received money for their Vulcan, Omega, and New Glenn rockets respectively. This Phase 1 contract money was dependent on the companies eventually winning a slot on the follow-on Phase 2 contract. This contract involved the handout of about 35 to 40 launches to two launch companies in a 60-40% split, although the total of missions handed out under this new contract has now gone up to 48. In 2020, this Phase 2 contract was awarded to ULA and SpaceX, with the 60% of missions going to ULA and the 40% going to SpaceX. This also meant that both Blue Origin and Northrop Grumman stopped receiving any Phase 1 money after that. Phase 3 started a few years later with a different focus. This time, the Space Force split the program into two lanes. Lane 1, which has missions that are more risk tolerant, and Lane 2, which has the most challenging missions for the military. Lane 1 would allow a yearly on-ramp of launch companies who would also not need to be able to perform all of the missions from Lane 2, something that leaves a lot more leeway for new entrants. 
On the other hand, Lane 2 would again feature a split in contracts among companies, but this time between three instead of two companies like we had during Phase 2. This first Phase 3 contract is for Lane 1, which means this is for the easier missions, so to speak. Both SpaceX and ULA already fly military missions, so this wouldn't be their first rodeo. However, this is the first time that Blue Origin is deemed eligible to fly a military mission instead of receiving a development contract, and it bid its new Glenn rocket for it. The conditions to receive this Lane 1 contract were that the companies must have a previously demonstrated flight or propose a credible plan to achieve a first launch by December 15, 2024. Blue Origin's New Glenn is currently gearing up for a first flight, no earlier than September, and things are coming together for that flight, so this rocket could, in theory, meet those conditions as well. For now, this announcement just says which companies are eligible to receive Phase 3 Lane 1 missions, and no known missions have actually been awarded yet. However, it's expected that the US Space Force will eventually start awarding Phase 3 Lane 1 missions later this year, so we'll have to keep an eye on who gets them when that happens. It's expected that other companies like Rocket Lab, Firefly, or Relativity will be on-ramped into Lane 1 over the next few years as their new rockets go through final development and finally start launching too. Lane 1 could feature up to 30 missions and up to $5.6 billion awarded between now and the end of 2029. So, of course, the competition is even more fierce this time around. As for Lane 2, the US Space Force says it'll award those contracts later this fall, so we'll be watching for those updates as well. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. We now know the first customer payload to launch on board ABL Space Systems RS-1 rocket, and it'll involve the launch of a space telescope called OWL on the rocket's third flight. OWL was developed by Scout Space, a commercial company that's working on space domain awareness technology, or in other words, they're working on sensors to look at other satellites in space. This first mission will work as a technology demonstration mission for commercial and government customers who may want to use OWL in the future. The company also revealed that it developed this telescope after another of its tech demos called Raven missed its own ride into space. The third-party spacecraft that Raven was supposed to fly on is now unlikely to get off the ground due to financial problems. While OWL's use case is for long-range tracking of other satellites, RAVEN can be used for close proximity operations and rendezvous in space. However, before Scout Space can demonstrate their technology in orbit, ABL first needs to successfully fly its RS-1. The first flight, which took place in January 2023, ended in failure, and the company is now set to try again later this summer with the rocket's second flight. Speaking of looking at satellites from other satellites in space, this week we had two really interesting satellite-to-satellite -satellite sightings shared by two different satellite companies. The first one is HEOSpace, which shared these pictures of the EarthCare satellite already deployed in orbit. This Earth observation satellite, developed jointly by ESA and JAXA, recently launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Vandenberg and is now healthy and undergoing its commissioning phase ahead of operations. Then we have this picture of the International Space Station, taken by Maxar's Worldview 3 satellite on June 7th at a distance of 276 kilometers. The photo shows in amazing detail both SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavor and Boeing's Starliner Calypso docked to the US side of the orbiting outpost. It's always nice to see these views as it gives us a different look at hardware that's already in orbit. But on the other hand, it kind of makes you wonder about the imaging capabilities that other satellites might have when their purpose isn't for commercial applications, but rather for military applications. The central module of the upcoming Lunar Gateway space station is being readied for testing. The module, called HALO, which is short for Habitation and Logistics Outpost, is being built by Thales Alenia Space in Turin, Italy. Teams completed welding of the module's main structure earlier this year and are now moving it to the company's test location. Once the stress tests are passed successfully, HALO will be moved all the way to Arizona, where Northrop Grumman will outfit the module ahead of launch. Launch is currently scheduled for no earlier than October 2025 on a Falcon Heavy, which will carry Gateway's power and propulsion element at the same time. Now let's go over all of the traffic in space during the past week, and then we'll see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 featuring the first Starlink Group 10 mission. Liftoff took place on June 8th at 1.56 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. This launch delivered 22 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, but SpaceX did not confirm whether these were all Starlink V2 Mini or some other kind of Starlink satellite. 
As this is the first launch of a new Starlink mission group, it opens up the possibility that these could be a new type of satellite, or that the satellites may be going to a new type of orbit. For example, Starlink Group 7 and Group 8 missions both go into the same orbital inclination, but Group 7 carries only V2 mini satellites, while Group 8 missions carry both V2 mini satellites and direct to cell satellites. This first Starlink Group 10 mission went into the same orbital inclination as Group 7 and 8, so we'll have to wait and see what differences there are for this to be considered a completely different group number. The booster flying this mission, B-1069, landed successfully on a shortfall of Gravitas, completing its 16th flight. Later that day, at 12.58 UTC, another Starlink mission launched, but this time from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg. On this mission, Falcon 9 delivered 13 Starlink direct-to-cell satellites and 7 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster supporting this mission, B-1061, ended its 21st flight by successfully landing on Of Course I Still Love You, becoming the second booster to launch and land 21 times. With the two Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has launched a total of 6,613 satellites, of which 460 have re-entered and 5,237 have moved into their operational orbit. Coming up later today, we'll have a Falcon 9 launch from Florida with the second Group 10 mission carrying another 22 Starlink satellites. After a scrub yesterday due to bad weather, SpaceX will try again at 2045 UTC with opportunities available all the way to 19 minutes past midnight UTC. Coming up next week, on June 18th, a Falcon 9 is set to launch from Florida, carrying the Astra 1P SES-24 communications satellite to geostationary transfer orbit. The roughly three-hour-long launch window for this mission is currently set to open at 2135 UTC, but will likely depend on the launch of Starlink Group 10 2 as they share the same launch pad. Electron is set to fly for the 50th time this week. The mission, called No Time to Loose, will launch five small satellites for the French company Kinase. This is the first launch for the company's constellation of 25 Internet of Things satellites. Liftoff is currently scheduled for June 18th at 1813 UTC from Rocket Lab Spaceport in New Zealand. Another Falcon 9 is set to launch this week, and this time it's for the first flight for Starlink Group 9, probably bringing even more fun speculation as to what's new. This batch of Starlink satellites will be launched from Vandenberg within a roughly 4-hour launch window that's set to open on June 19th at 3 o'clock UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.